So I would now give the floor immediately to the Director General of the Director General for Research and Innovation in the European Commission. Jean-Éric, the floor is yours. Peter, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, um, everyone. I'm particularly happy to open the webinar this afternoon on, on how uh, you can uh, prepare yourself uh, to be part of successful projects, how you can prepare yourself as a scientist, as an institution, uh, how you can also impactfully team up across Europe uh, to be part of, um, of successful projects. I'm very happy to do that because the event today really marks a, a moment when we really move from a big, big effort to prepare the program, negotiate it uh, successfully also for the budget, uh, prepare the priorities of the um, early years of the program, in large co-design um, across Europe, notably at the Research and Innovation Days last September. And we are now really going with call for proposals um, uh, running for the European Research Council, for the European Innovation Council. There will be a specific call now uh, co connected to um, COVID-19 uh, uh, and a number of uh, additional projects we want uh, uh, to see uh, emerge to help um, Europe uh, move beyond the pandemic and the main work programs, if you want, for Horizon Europe uh, will be uh, out um, and calls will take place um, as of April and May with information days um, happening as well. But today is really the first time where we engage with um, thousands of you um, to look at indeed um, uh, the ground rules of um, Horizon Europe so that you know how um, we expect you to work um, on the model grant agreement, how to work um, on a number of requirements on open science, um, on gender, uh, but also how to um, best use um, the facilities uh, around the portal, uh, which is um, now of course updated and, and upgraded uh, for you to be uh, preparing yourselves. And as part of that, obviously, project submission and evaluation uh, evaluations are absolutely key moments. So uh, I'm not going to uh, go into the content of that. This will be done by Peter Hartwich and his team throughout uh, the afternoon following um, already good discussions this morning. What I want to close on is by uh, telling you that European research is um, has a great platform with Horizon Europe which will have no doubt uh, make a big difference, including in structuring the way we as Europeans um, uh, see research and innovation between ourselves and in support to Europe's future and future transformations. But that European research is first and primarily yourselves. So you need to engage, you need to engage in preparing these great projects that carry us forward. So I'm grateful for your interest today. I'm even more grateful for the energy, enthusiasm, and uh, great um, scientific knowledge, disruptive ideas uh, that you will put into these preparations. And I'm very much looking forward to see the first uh, projects selected um, in the autumn. With that, uh, best of luck um, in the future, and I hope you will have uh, a useful uh, webinar this afternoon uh, to prepare you. Merci beaucoup. Peter, back to you. Thank you very much. And indeed, we will now turn immediately to the technical details of participation. You know, the afternoon session is um, dedicated to the model grant agreement. And we have our colleagues from the legal unit joining. And the series of presentations will be started by my colleague Simona Staiku. So Simona, please take the floor and show us your slides. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll uh, share my screen. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so this afternoon, uh, we'll focus on the presenting the main novelties for the Horizon Grant, uh, Europe Grant Agreement. We have seen uh, uh, in the morning uh, how to successfully prepare for an application and submit the application and get a successful application. And now we'll see what happens afterward. 
So basically, you after you are invited to the grant agreement preparation form, you'll end up with signing a grant agreement with us. What is the grant agreement? Is the contractual document, which takes now the electronic form, uh, form which you'll sign with, okay, what we call a granting authority by basically either with a commission or one of our uh, executive agencies. And in this grant agreement, you may find as uh, a all what you need to implement successfully the work. So you have your rights where you know exactly how, what are your rights to receive, uh, for instance, to own the results for the work you are uh, doing. What are your obligation? Of course, what is to implement the project as you described and you submitted in the Annex 1. And of course, how much money uh, you can get. Now, depending, uh, I, I will not insist because these are the most general point and given the uh, uh, that we have only one hour we'll say we want to run you through the main uh, point in the grant agreement when you applied for uh, the uh, to be a member and to participate in a in a project in horizon europe you either apply, you applied and you made part of a consortia but then when you participate and if you are part of the consortia and you sign the grant agreement you become a beneficiary so beneficiaries are all those who sign the uh, grant agreement with that and have all the rights and obligation you may also have been part of the consortia for instance but you do not sign a grant agreement in other forms others of affiliated entities and then you'll also carry work uh, uh, carry out work under the actions but then if you participate as an affiliated entities and you're brought in by the beneficiaries who sign the grant agreement with us you have to have a capital or legal link with one of the beneficiary or as an associated partner for when you still can carry out work but as different from an affiliated uh, entity we cannot declare costs under grant agreement i, I will explain a bit further uh, down in the presentation uh, more about these two uh, type of beneficiaries that uh, type of participants that can uh, be involved in the project However, how does the look this Horizon Europe grant agreement we are talking about? So this grant, as we usually call it in our, uh, let's say, terminology. First, I say it's a contractual document, but in fact, it's an electronic form because the Horizon Europe grant agreement is fully managed in an electronic uh, way. It's from the signature because it's done electronically by the coordinator uh, through the system until the end and all the payment and reporting and the conversation and communication are done via the workflows which are set up in the funding and tenders portal and in the systems with us. However, for the as for the structure or organization of the grant agreement, we will see that there is for those who have participated in Horizon 2020, there is a bit of a different approach in Horizon Europe, in the sense that there's going to be a part which is called corporate part structure, which is the same for all commission directly managed. Uh, program, uh, programs. So if you are participating in one program, let's say Erasmus, or you are participating also, you'll be participating in Horizon Europe, the structure and the core text of the grant agreement will be the same. We are called call this corporate molder grant agreement. At the same time, you will see that Horizon Europe and being research has important specificities to be taken into account. And all these specificities are scattered in the Annex 5. For the other program, the Annex 5 as well will uh, include their own specificities. Corporate approach, because we said there is a corporate part and the specific part. What are the corporate features of Horizon Europe? And why we need a corporate first? Is all the, you have heard maybe that one of the most important aspects in Horizon Europe besides simplification is also to increase synergies. And the synergies are coming from when you have uh, common rules, horizontal rules, which apply 
to the extent possible to all the programs. So going from one program to another, you have the same rules on reporting or you have the same procedure when you need to amend the grant because you need to change something in the grant or because the terminology is the same. So that makes it easier for you to go and may participate and have more successfully in different programs. Because we, when we mention, for instance, granting authority, you will know that in all the grants from program to program is either the commission or one of the executive agencies, depending on whom you sign the grant and the program you are participating. Or for the beneficiaries, you still is the same, the same terminology is used, the same uh, rules, uh, rights and obligations for the beneficiaries apply from program pro program. Uh, or the, um, uh, the specifications in general for the CFS, but my colleagues will present later. Uh, as for uh, 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 another uh, point, another uh, aspect of the corporate mort uh, grant agreement or the corporate provisions are that they are less descriptive. So you'll see uh, uh, many references to different published templates because you will not have all the explanation on the template since we said that the grant agreement is managed completely electronically, so via the electronic system, all the references in the grant agreement will be to this template, and that will make it easier and shorter in, uh, to have provisions in the grant agreement. And, and last, but you'll see, uh, well, not last, but another example on the corporate is the alignment with the financial regulation, because the financial regulation is the underlying base on which all the programs are uh, are built and from where most of the rule, unless otherwise specified and specific for the pro uh, one program, like for us, Horizon Europe, are set out from a financial point of view. So, uh, for instance, in case of receipt, which will now be uh, only for profit legal entities. The corporate structure, how does it look? We talked about, so we talked about this corporate structure, how does it look? It has two main parts, if we can say so. The first part, which is a novelty on the Horizon Euro for those who have participated in Horizon 2020 is the data sheet. The data sheet, if you have already looked in the published version of the Horizon Model Grant Agreement, is a, so a summary of the data which is specific to you and which you can access very quickly and at a first glance in the very beginning of the grant agreement. It contains general data, the name of the participants, so you'll see all the beneficiaries the grant amount, which is a reporting schedule, which are the payments how you uh, that you need to do, how, what are the consequences in case uh, there is a breach of obligation or what is the applicable law, for instance. Uh, the, uh, after the data sheet, there, is, there are the articles. For those who are familiar to Horizon 2020, you'll notice that this corporate is to a very large extent similar also in structure to the Horizon 2020 Molder Grant Agreement. There's, so the grouping is uh, of these articles is extreme is uh, relatively similar. We still start with the general articles where we have the project name, the duration of the article, uh, the, uh, the duration of the grant, continuing with the grant and the funding rates and the grant amount, going through the eligible cost, still Article 6 for those who work in the Horizon 2020, and then going from grant implementation parts from, so the rules on the participants that I mentioned from beneficiary to third parties, all the third parties involved in the action uh, for payments, reporting, continuous, for instance, reporting is one of the aspects which is now specifically mentioned in the grant agreement and consequences of non-compliance as well. Uh, after the grant agreement, we have annexes. Uh, we have not, uh, not discussed all the annexes of the grant agreement, but I will mention some of them. We have five annexes. Of course, Annex 1, description of, our, of work, as uh, uh, also in Horizon 2020. Annex 2 is the annex which is based on cost. So the uh, financial annex or the budget, estimated budget. Annex 3 is the one uh, for uh, 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 the, the beneficiary for accession forms. So the, those who beneficiary who exceed to the grant agreement. Annex 
uh, four is the uh, financial statement and annex five i mentioned already is the specific forms uh, so Annex 5, 2 of the corporate uh, grant agreement, and this structure, as mentioned already, is the similar and same from all uh, grant agreements under for all the directly you manage program, contains basically five categories of costs. So we have the personal cost where we have already what we are for those who are familiarized, the same uh, type of personal cost that we are familiar from Horizon 2020. So for employees, those who, uh, who have an employment contract, the natural person who work under a direct contract with the beneficiary, seconded personnel, on SME owners or those natural person who participate as a beneficiary but do not receive a salary uh, register as uh, such in the account. They are all in the personal cost category. Subcontracting costs, it's still for those who participate and carry out work in the actions, but uh, um, for which they uh, claim a price and the beneficiary uh, uh, reimburses uh, the, the price uh, asked by the subcontractor uh, under similar condition as Horizon 2020, so no uh, conflict of interest and best value for money. Purchase cost, which now is grouping a bit different from Horizon 2020, um, uh, three types of costs, but it's just in grouping in the sense that we have travel and subsistence costs, equipment costs, and other goods, works, and services, which are not travel and equipment. And they are all costs name purchase cost and not other uh, uh, goods and services costs, and not in the um, other direct or sorry, as in Horizon 2020. So it's a change in terminology. And other cost category, actually, what we have is now, and it's uh, seen also here comes the specificities of Horizon Europe. We have the financial support to third parties, which already have in Horizon 2020 and is similar from program to program. But we also have here specific uh cost categories for horizon europe internally invoice goods and services my uh colleague julian will talk about uh, uh later a bit uh, a bit is specific to horizon uh europe and which will be uh possible to charge costs uh, under horizon europe for all those beneficiaries who are working and uh, uh, uh with this type of a uh, unit cost and calculated in accordance with the usual cost accounting practices and all the other specific costs but that will depend if you are participated in in, in a type for instance in a, in a type of action like ERC then you'll have potentially ERC additional funding and are either general or for some type of cost and the indirect cost and I remember there was some uh, questions in the uh, morning which is the flat rate of course with some uh, uh, exceptions for the subcontracting cost financial support to third parties and other cost categories, which include already indirect costs, su such, for instance, internally invoice goods and services, to take an example. The corporate structure I mentioned already is completed by the Annex 5. The Annex 5 in the structure is similar for program per program, but this Annex contains the non-financial specificities or the policy initiative, which uh, are specific to Horizon 2020 uh, to Horizon Europe. So from ethics uh, uh, and research integrity in uh, which complements the article, the core text article, which is general to all the program uh, name here, Article 14, for IPR rules, where you know that in Horizon Europe, similar to Horizon 2020, given that this is research, the IPR rules are very detailed and specific, and other specific rules for uh, carrying out the action, which reflect the specificity of our different program parts, being uh, EIT, being ERC, or uh, PCP, PPI um, rules. Uh, just one thing that I wanted to mention, this presentation is focusing mostly, as you have seen, on the corporate part and will continue with the financial novelties of the Horizon Europe. All other aspects will be dealt in subsequent webinars, given that we have a timeline and given that 
uh, we will have this uh, uh, future webinars, and this is only the first one in a large series of webinars on uh, which will follow on thematic areas. Moving to the Horizon Europe General Model Grant Agreement, I don't know if you have seen, but for those who have not seen, it's already there. So you already have it there, it's published, it was published last month on the 25th of February, so all one month, we say. And uh, you may find it in the reference document under uh, funding and tenders portal uh, for under the Horizon Europe program. The main change is now for the Horizon Europe moving a bit more from the corporate in the Horizon Europe. At a glance, more for, the, for you are these. As I mentioned already, open science and IPR exploitation will be not dealt during this presentation since we are focusing on the financial part of the grant agreement. I will only go, uh, because I mentioned already, very quickly to the third parties, because there are some changes as regards uh, Horizon 2020 for those who uh, are familiar or Horizon 2020. Remember the first slide where I, saw, I said that uh, uh, beneficiaries signed the grant agreement, and you may participate, but you are bring, brought in by the beneficiary as a third party who does not sign the grant agreement. I mentioned two who may carry out work under the action, I affiliated entities and associated partners. What are affiliated entities? Affiliated entities for, all, for those who participate in Horizon 2020 is linked third parties. It is just a change of labeling of terminology in order to uh, align to the financial regulation terminology and they use the same terminology from program to program everywhere will see the same name, affiliated entities. So they are those links are parties in Horizon 2020. They carry out work. They have a particular link, capital or legal link with the beneficiary, which predates and postdates the grant agreement. So no specifically created for the action, for the uh, purposes of the action. And they will uh, carry out work and uh, declare costs under the grant agreement, similar as they, they were a beneficiary. Associated partner, you also know it was a large extent because it's built upon what we call the international partner in Horizon 2020 for those participated. They are still third parties. Uh, they do not sign the grant agreement. They have a, a link either to one or more beneficiaries in the grant agreement, or they can have now, and that is new, a link to the whole consortium in the grant agreement. They carry out work, but they cannot declare cost, and their cost will not be taken, so they uh, will not be taken into account. In fact, they simply cannot declare them. So they have, however, the terminology was also adapted and now became a corporate terminology and the corp with a corporate status. That means also associate par partners will be present in other programs under uh, this MFF. Uh, being a third party, uh, similar to a lot of other third parties in the grant agreement, the main rule is that the beneficiary, you as if you are a beneficiary, remain responsible for the third party you are bringing into the action. And therefore, in the, and, uh, the some of the obligation also have to ensure uh, uh, you as a beneficiary that apply to the third party. In the case, for instance, an associated partner, one of these was being proper implementation of the action because these associated partners are carrying out work under the action. And this will be for my part. So this one, uh, which is a bit giving you the general ideas, I'm giving now the floor and uh, to my colleague, Morton, uh, who will take over and present uh, uh, the part on the corporate uh, daily rate and to walk you through the participant, uh, through the um, personal costs. Yes, thank you, Simona. And um, good afternoon, dear participants. I'm Morten Gülling. I'm working in Simona's team, the, the um, MGA uh, team. We have prepared the, the model grant agreement for Horizon Europe. And I will just share with you the presentation, uh, the continuation, in fact, of the presentation, and try to minimize um, all the black boxes. I hope it looks um, 
good now. So indeed, as um, as Simona just explained, um, I'll continue to talk about the personnel cost. Simona just mentioned personnel cost on one of her slides uh, when she talked about Annex 2. And uh, important also here to note that uh, that when we talk about personnel cost, uh, and as is written here on the slide, uh, the corporate uh, daily rate provisions, we um, will see quite a significant change in um, uh, compared to Horizon 2020. In that, uh, for instance, uh, the personnel cost will not only be uh, harmonized and and be the same across uh, the framework program uh, itself. So uh, uh, no matter in which part of the framework program you participate, so this could be uh, in the standard uh, RIA and IA projects, in the partnerships, in the missions, in the EIT, EIC, ERC, uh, you will have to uh, use the same approach when you report um, your report personnel cost. But and this is the really new thing. You will actually also use the same approach, the same method for reporting, declaring, and and calculating personnel cost when you when you participate in in other programs of the European Commission. So, for instance, if you have a project in in funded by the Digital Europe program, well, you will have exactly the same. Uh, 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 rules uh, uh, in your uh, project. And this is in fact due to this uh, corporate approach. So back to the personnel cost and um, and back to um, uh, and back to uh, why we uh, have, have made a change here. Now, let's first uh, take a step back in time, um, back to uh, our uh, uh, Horizon 2020 framework program. Now, as many of you uh, who participated in Horizon 2020 uh, hopefully have uh, experienced and, and also have seen, there is quite a, a, a number of options uh, in order to calculate and report your personnel cost. So uh, the idea in Horizon 2020 was that we developed quite a fine-grained and, and very detailed system that allowed uh, you uh, to, to, uh, to take into account uh, uh, the, the, the hours and the, uh, the remuneration that, that was spent on each uh, person working on the project. So indeed, the personnel cost was based on hours. You had to calculate an hourly rate, multiply by that by the uh, hours worked on the project. And um, and let's say the, the, uh, the number of possibilities uh, you had to choose between for calculating the hourly rate gave rise to um, uh, quite some reactions from the stakeholders during what um, our director general just mentioned in the beginning uh, uh, as the co-creation exercise uh, and implementation strategy of Horizon Europe, um, that this system was simply uh, too detailed, too complex. We also had uh, internal criticism from the European Court of Auditors who asked us to drastically simplify this, um, this system. Now, uh, this being said, of course, we uh, in Horizon Europe are also now part of this uh, corporate environment where uh, the rules uh, will be harmonized. And, and, and uh, it uh, was quite clear from the beginning that uh, in terms of the common rules, uh, the rules that are common to all the programs, uh, the Horizon Europe uh, the Horizon 2020 rules for personnel cost will uh, no longer uh, continue. It will no longer be a part of, of the, the common set of rules. So indeed, instead of focusing uh, on hours, instead of having a very fine-grained uh, system for calculating personnel cost, we will now move into a, a much more simple cal calculation, a much less fine-grained calculation, where we, instead of focusing on hours, focus on 
days worked on the project. Now, that may come as a surprise. Uh, some might say that it's not very uh, logical, but I'll try to walk you through uh, the reasons high behind uh, this new approach and also uh, hopefully uh, highlighting some of the advantages from your side when uh, moving from a focus on hours and uh, a focus into a focus on, on days. Um, uh, and not only have we changed the focus from uh, hours into days, we will also uh, discontinue the, uh, the different formulas, ranging from uh, annual to monthly uh, uh, calculations and, and different options for productive hours. It, as mentioned by many stakeholders, it was difficult to implement and, 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 and audits also showed that it was quite error prone. Uh, we will also discontinue the notion of the last close financial year and focus more on the calendar year. I'll get back to the last close financial year in just a minute, so don't worry if you don't know what I'm referring to here. So instead, we will use a singly corporate daily rate and we will uh, follow a calendar year approach. So for the future, what you need to uh, remember when we talk about personnel cost is not the detailed slide I showed you just before with all the different options. You simply just need to understand that the daily rate uh, 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 multiplied by the days worked in the project equals your personal cost uh, you need to report to the project. Now in the uh, coming slides, I will um, go through what we mean by a daily rate, how to calculate this. And I'll also talk about the, uh, the new record uh, keeping rules uh, for, uh, for recording and documenting the days worked on the project. So let's say the two elements of, of uh, the equation here. Now, uh, for the daily rate, uh, it's quite simple. There's one way of calculating the daily rate under Horizon Europe. You will no, lo no longer have to um, uh, to analyze, to assess which option available is the best one for you to go along with. And that was indeed the, the, one of the issues with, um, with Horizon 2020 that um, uh, that uh, at least some stakeholders uh, made it clear to us that the most favorable option uh, to follow was not uh, always the easiest one. Now, we have made it easy for you in Horizon uh, Europe because the daily rate will simply uh, be, be the actual annual uh, personnel cost for the person working on the project. Uh, divided by 215 days, okay? So uh, the 215 days is a standard fixed, prefixed, if you like, a number that uh, you will not be able to change. It will simply be, um, be uh, a part of this, uh, this calculation as a, as a fixed number. Now, of course, the actual annual Personal cost for the person will depend uh, uh, from person to person. But if we just take a fictive example, you have a person that is uh, uh, in your organization. Uh, she's been working on the project. Uh, her salary is uh, 21,500 uh, per year. I'm just taking this because it will be very easy to calculate the daily rate. Uh, you multiply this uh, annual personnel cost. So the basically the salary, the remuneration for this person over the, over the year in question, you divide it by 215 and you have a daily rate of 100 uh, euros. Hello, colleagues. Can you still hear Morten? 
Uh, no, I cannot hear him. No. Could someone take over? I can if you can. want, Peter. Oh. Yes, please. I think we left. We we lost him completely. Oh, okay. Yes, so I... so give me just three seconds, and I will uh, yes. share my screen, and, and I take. Thanks over. a lot. Thank you. So I hope you can you can all hear me now, yeah. Yes, yes. very good. Okay, the slides so, are there too. Okay, perfect. So I think you have no black box or things uh, still popping up uh, on 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 the screen. So I will take it uh, uh, from there from Morton. So apologies for uh, for this uh, little uh, little issue with the connection. Uh, my name is uh, Julien Dulo. I am uh, a colleague of Morton and Simona. So I will be one of your co-captain today to fly you over this presentation and to continue the presentation of uh, of Morton on the personal cost calculation. Uh, so I will start immediately with uh, with uh, with the slide where we unfortunately uh, uh, lost Morton. So just. Um, to 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 summarize the things, there will not be any more several options or several uh, formulas to calculate personal actual personal cost in uh, in Horizon Europe. Instead, there will be one single uh, formula, and 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 this this will be with this one display on the screen. So, meaning you will have to take uh, at the numerator of the actual annual personal cost of the person, and you will have to divide by a fixed number of days, which will be two hundred fifty. There will be. Um, let's say an exception um, uh, for this uh, corporate way of calculating personal costs. So that will apply not only to Horizon Europe, but to other EU program. Uh, you may still deduct actual working days spent on parental leave from this fixed number of days. And this way, you actually increase the denominator. So mathematically speaking, uh, the, the way you calculate the daily rate, uh, it contributes to, to, to the cost. Uh, uh, you may still incur when uh, when one of your employees is uh, is on parental leave, and we we, we contribute to the time the person was uh, was uh, working on on the action previously. So, this is actually something that was existing in Horizon 2020 when you you will be entitled to deduct uh, days spent on parental leave from uh, from productive hours in Horizon 2020. Here, it will be a deduction from this fixed number of days for Horizon Europe. Um, if I continue with the presentation. Um, Julien, Julien, I'm actually back. Yeah, so Morten, you want to, to continue with this slide or? I think everything else would be unfair to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Um, so apologies for uh, being uh, kicked uh, out. Maybe Julien, if you can just control the slides, I think you know when to to switch to the next slide. Uh, so I, we don't need to make that. Um, uh, to make that. So apologies for uh, momentarily being kicked off the server I'm, I'm back again and um, and I think Julien the last thing I heard you talked about was uh, was uh, indeed the, the 215 days and the, the possibility to um, to deduct any time spent on parental leave now in terms of the daily rate calculation uh, when do you need to do it? Well, you need to do it once per. Uh, you need to do it per calendar year. So the calendar year is, of course, from January to uh, to December. And uh, again, there is the exception, and I think this exception will be relevant to a lot of you because in case that your reporting period uh, ends not in 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 by the end of December, but let's say during the year then of course you need to calculate a pro rata for those, uh, for those years without, which are not complete. So in other words, that the, um, the, the, you simply um, uh, uh, divide the 215 days with a 12 months, and then you multiply it by the number of months that you worked from uh, January until the end of the reporting period. And uh, if this is too complicated, uh, let we just let me just go to the next slide where there is an example. 
And the example is indeed uh, with a, a reporting period covering three years where uh, the last year is not complete. So it's only for, for three months during the last year. So we have a researcher, why, that, uh, that um, uh, uh, works in a project and there is the first reporting period. The first reporting period runs from September 2021 until uh, the end of May, March, sorry, 2023. Now, uh, here you will need to calculate uh, three uh, daily rates for this uh, particular researcher. One for 2021, another one for 2022, and a third one for 2023. Uh, and the way to do this is simply you take the the actual annual personnel cost incurred for the person during the first year divided by um, uh, uh, 200 and, uh, and uh, 15, and then you multiply it by the days worked by that person on the action from the 1st of September uh, 21. Now, for uh, the uh, second uh, year, the second project year, uh, you simply uh, repeat that um, uh, that calculation, uh, but of course uh, the annual personnel cost uh, incurred for that person may have increased or maybe have decreased uh, for 2022, and uh, most likely also the days worked on uh, on the action for this person will change. In this case, probably increase because we have more months uh, covered. Then for the last year, we indeed apply this pro rata. We, we again take the, the actual uh, annual, uh, 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 not annual, but we take the actual personnel cost incurred for the person during the, the first three months of the, um, uh, of the year, uh, 2023. Uh, and then we divide that by our 215 days divided by 12, multiplied by the three months, January, February, and March. And then again, we take that and multiply it by the number of days worked uh, by that person on the project during the first three months of the year. It may sound complicated, uh, but uh, uh, let's say compared to uh, what we had in the the past on the uh, horizon 2020, uh, indeed the calculation uh, is not more complex. I even tend to say it's uh, it's much uh, easier because you here you only calculate uh, three daily rates. You don't need to uh, to to calculate um, hourly rates. You don't need to calculate uh, monthly. Uh, um, or only need to multiply by, uh, or sorry, need to, to follow a monthly or annual approach. So uh, this was just an example. On the next slide, we'll go a bit more into the days worked part of, 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 this, uh, uh, of this calculation. And when we talk about days worked, of course, we also need to talk about record keeping. So for the days uh, worked, uh, you have two ways of documenting it. You can either uh, continue to use your uh, your time records or time sheets, or which can be either on paper or it could could be in a computer based system. Uh, or uh, and this is where we will introduce another a simplification measure, is that you can simply sign a monthly uh, declaration on days spent for the action. This is a template that we in the Commission are developing. It will uh, most likely be found in the annotated bundle grant agreement uh, and hopefully also in the IT systems. But uh, as is written here on the slide, we're still developing this uh, template and, and looking into the, the simplest way, simplest way of, of introducing it and making pe uh, people and beneficiaries aware that this one exists let's say, as a simplified record keeping uh, uh, method. So indeed, the days worked uh, also simplified uh, uh, on the horizon in Europe. For the next uh, uh, slide here, we 
during our various uh, consultation of stakeholders uh, and, and also due to, the, let's say, common sense, we are, of course, uh, and our general knowledge, we are, of course, aware that uh, many organizations do not, uh, well, they have a record system, record time record system in place already, and that is not necessarily based on days, but on hours, minutes, second, something else. In case you have one that is based on hours, uh, you can, as I just showed on the last slide, still continue to use this, don't worry. Uh, and uh, in order to uh, convert the hours that, that you recorded in your system in today's, we, we provide you with, with three conversion rules. Now, one of them uh, uh, is simply that you convert uh, your hours in today's by taking the average number of hours um, uh, that a, the person in question here uh, must work uh, per working day uh, according to his or her contract. So an example could be that you have a person working or that must work uh, 37 and a half hours per week distributed over five uh, working days. And then you simply multiply those, uh, simply divide those two numbers and you get a, 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 a day equivalent of seven and a half hour. Now, uh, of course, if you uh, work part-time, for instance, 50%, you simply divide that number by two, uh, taking the relevant numbers uh, uh, into account. So uh, for those of you who have either an employment contract or an appointment uh, act that, that says how much you, you need to work per month, per day per week, you will be able to use this conversion rule uh, number one. Conversion rule number two is uh, based on uh, what we could call the, the business continuity from Horizon 2020, simply that you can, uh, if you participate, uh, this will be relevant maybe to, to, to those of you who participate in many uh, Horizon 2020 projects using the, the usual standard annual productive hours uh, option in there for calculating personnel cost. And you will simply be able to convert your hours into days by, by using that approach. Again, with an example, you have a, a beneficiary or legal entity where the, the standard annual productive hours are um, 1600 uh, hours per year that the, let's say the, the staff works uh, in this legal entity. Now, um, uh, you then take these uh, 1600 uh, hours divided by our fixed 215 days, and you, you get a day equivalent of uh, almost the same as in the first example, but in this case, uh, seven hours and uh, 44. Okay. Then uh, again, we want to make it simple. So there is also a third conversion rule, uh, which, which can be used for all of those of you who want to make it very simple. You simply take a, a, um, a, our a prefixed number of uh, eight hours equals one day equivalent. And that is in case you have no reference uh, in, a, in, in the contract of your employees, or if you are not using any standard annual productive hours as your usual uh, accounting practices. Now, um, when, if I have my time recording system in, in hours, again, how often do I need to do this uh, conversion? Now, I think there's been quite some misunderstandings uh, at least in the beginning where we when we presented this uh, this change from uh, from a focus on on how many hours you worked on the project into how many days you worked on the project and the idea here is that you will not have to calculate your uh, your daily rate uh, every time you work uh, a day uh, on the project you simply only need to calculate it per calendar year, 
We saw it in my example before with the reporting period covering three years, that there was just a, a one uh, calculation of the daily rate per year, okay? So uh, in this case, you only need to do the conversion also once uh, per calendar year. Of course, if you have multiple reporting periods, like two reporting periods in the same calendar year, you will need to do it uh, twice. Now, um, uh, again here, uh, if we have uh, 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 an example uh, at the time of a reporting period, so if a daily rate is calculated for 2021, uh, you only need to convert um, uh, the, the total number of hours in today's equivalent uh, for uh, 2021 altogether. Okay, so I hope it's clear that uh, it this conversion of hours for those of you where this is relevant in today's does not entail uh, a large number of, of, of calculations. It simply uh, only implies one calculation per calendar year, typically uh, when you do your reporting. And uh, on the next slide, we would just like to summarize uh, the main difference in calculating personnel cost from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe. Indeed, there will be a discontinuation of various formulas based on either an annual or monthly basis. We will also discontinue with the options for productive hours. We will no longer uh, focus on the last closed financial year. You saw that in my examples, we focus on the uh, the, the relevant calendar year. It does not need to be closed. So we had the example of 2023, where we took the three months, the, the salary that was paid uh, for the three months, we, we, we could use them. We did not uh, had to use the, the, the numbers of 2020 uh, to the, the previous year, it's because that one was closed. Now also, <clears throat> Uh, I have explained to you that we will use a singly corporate daily rate and a calendar year approach, which is relevant not only to all parts of Horizon Europe, but also relevant to all parts uh, of uh, all programs under the, the European uh, Commission. Um, this was the main uh, a way of calculating your personnel cost. Of course, we have over the the, the, the previous years in implementing the framework programs for uh, research and innovation uh, also uh, developed some specific rules uh, for um, for let's say specific uh, uh, personal cost categories simona showed uh, you some of them uh, on her slide there will still be the possibility for the uh, small and medium-sized enterprise uh, company owners to declare a, a, a unit cost um, if they don't receive a salary. And uh, we will also continue with what we in Horizon 2020 called uh, additional remuneration. But in Horizon Europe, we will uh, use the term project-based remuneration. And my colleague, Julien, who was just substituting me uh, during my, uh, my fallout, will uh, actually explain to you a bit more about uh, what improvements we have done within the project-based remuneration. So Julien, thanks a lot for taking over. Uh, and uh, the floor is yours again. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. So uh, good afternoon again, and sorry for having been uh, uh, indeed a substitute on the, on the soccer field for, uh, for, uh, for five minutes. Um, so now I would like to, to continue the presentation focusing on Horizon uh, Europe uh, specific provision and specific financial related provision. So um, I think it was important that um, today you, you, you start becoming acquainted with, um, with the corporate structure, uh, Simona mentioned, and also the personal cost calculation. Morten just explained uh, this uh, so-called general case where uh, that will apply not only for Horizon Europe, but also for, for other 
other EU programs. Uh, I think it was it was important to to, to understand these uh, these changes of structure and 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 particularly uh, this change for one of the major cost items, which is generally uh, personal cost. So uh, now I would like to 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 continue with specific provision uh, um, which are cost related, uh, which are specific to Horizon Europe. And the idea is not to, to go into details and details and to go into the integrity on, on, on all the things. I will have one slide for, for each topic because today um, amongst you, I'm pretty sure there are different people with different level of knowledge. And the idea is to, to bring all of you on the, on the same page and, and, and for you to get the main key features in terms of, uh, of, uh, of specific cost eligibility aspect, I would say, regarding Horizon Europe. And of course, uh, uh, after, uh, during, uh, during the question and answer session via, via Slido, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, answer your question. Uh, if they are very detailed or specific, we will, uh, we will try to, to do our best. But the idea is really to, to give you a main takeaways. So um, I would like to start with something um, that maybe for some of you, um, you are already familiar with, uh, with this uh, concept. It's called project-based remuneration. So it's really a specificity we have in Horizon Europe and it is inherited from Horizon 2020. Uh, it is something inherited from, uh, from uh, the topic which was, uh, which was known as additional remuneration in Horizon 2020. So it's basically continuity with Horizon 2020. And here, it's specific provision we have in the Horizon Europe Model Grant Agreement on top of um, standard corporate general personal cost provision more than just uh, presented to you. And uh, the idea is to cover specificities or specific issues we have been made aware uh, during implementation of previous framework program in the field of research and innovation. And uh, it concerns, we know, uh, it concerns some of uh, our beneficiaries and this is a, a specific feature we wanted also to, 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 to address and to continue to address for Horizon Europe. So basically what is it, project-based uh, remuneration? Um, it's usual remuneration practices of a legal entity. So in your, in, your, in your institution, in your establishment, uh, which consists in, in providing personnel with an increase of remuneration because this person, this personnel is working on a project. So really, uh, the triggering event for uh, uh, having an increase of the remuneration of the person, it's because this person is involved in a project. So this is why it's called project-based remuneration. Uh, the increase of level of remuneration is triggered by participation of someone in a, in a project. And this is part of the usual remuneration practices of, of your uh, legal entity. How it materialize? Um, this is just an example, um, but it could be could materialize when you, as an employee, get a bonus or a new contract uh, with a higher salary level because you are involved now uh, in, a, in a project. So if this remuneration practices are in place in your institution. Um, there will be a possibility to declare uh, this project-based remuneration cost uh, according to specific rules in Horizon Europe. And here, um, the key question is how much you can, you can declare. And actually, the, the answer is stemming from what we have in, uh, in uh, the forthcoming uh, officially, to be officially adopted uh, regulation for Horizon Europe. You can declare your actual remuneration cost, uh, so you as legal entity employing a, a given person, for the time this person has worked on the action, so it's an action daily rate, up to the level of remuneration that this person would be paid for work in a research and innovation project funded by national scheme. So it functions as a sailing, this last part of, uh, of the sentence. So it's possible to declare project-based remuneration up to a certain amount, and this certain amount is actually a kind of, uh, of benchmark, uh, a reference amount, and this is what we call a national project day rate. And how you have to, 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 to declare your cost? What is the methodolo methodology stemming from these uh, uh, rules, which are reflected in the Horizon Europe MGA, but as I said, which are stemming from uh, the regulation of Horizon Europe itself from the rules of participation of Horizon Europe. So you will have basically to calculate an action daily rate uh, for, uh, for a given employee and you will have to compare with 
the remuneration he would have received for working in research innovation project funded at national level. And this is what we call the national project daily rate. And you will have to compare these two daily rates. And you will have to take the lower of the two to comply with uh, uh, what is displayed on your screen in the middle column uh, to, to ensure that you not, do not pay more than uh, usually this person would receive for being involved in a nationally funded project. Now, um, where this remuneration practices is, is, is generally reflected, where, where it comes from. Generally, it's because you have something either at national law or in your collective labor agreement. So this is what we call regulatory requirement. So if you have something in your national law speaking about project-based remuneration, so uh, rules for increasing your remuneration or increasing the remuneration, for instance, of a category of personnel like researchers, like engineers, when they work in nationally funded projects, this will be the rules of reference you will have to take into account for calculate, calculating a national project daily rate. It could be also that you may find uh, these uh, uh, practices, these rules, in your written internal remuneration rules. So this is something that can be developed at uh, the level of an institution. Uh, so to, to, to write a set of rules dealing uh, with uh, the criteria that apply when uh, someone is involved in a, in a project and, and dealing with the increase of remuneration and the way, the form it would take when someone is involved in a, in a, in a project. So this is what is project-based remuneration. So if you have to, to really um, keep in, your, in the back of your mind today some takeaways for project-based remuneration, if you are not so familiar with this concept, this is really uh, the, the things you have to, 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 to remember. So it's when your remuneration is increasing because of your participation in a project, it's eligible up to a certain amount. And this certain amount is what we call uh, the remuneration you would receive for nationally funded projects. This is what we call the national project daily rate. Moving to another cost category, a specific cost category applicable in Horizon Europe. Again, this is something inherited also from Horizon 2020, so it's also a, a continuation here. Uh, it's the specific cost uh, category related to internally invoiced goods and services. Um, here, Actually, so I was just saying, um, this is something in a routine from Horizon 2020 because this is something which has been introduced in the course of Horizon 2020 implementation uh, as an extra cost category, a specific cost category for Horizon 2020. And we, we, we wanted to continue with this specific cost category because it addresses a lot of uh, concerns and, and specificities, especially in the research field. For certain organization, uh, generally quite large organization, why? Because internal invoicing is actually referring to cost or for goods and services which are produced or provided within the beneficiaries organization, within your organization. Um, and, and something, for instance, if you have a large organization or for instance, a university with several departments, uh, you have this kind of um, budget shift that materialize via this internal, internal invoicing system uh, when a department needs a, a, a a good or a service from another department, but these two departments belong to the same uh, legal entity. So this is why it's called internal invoicing. And we know that for some beneficiaries in the research field, uh, their usual practices is to value uh, uh, this, uh, this internal invoicing. So they have developed, uh, they have usual cost accounting practices to uh, have internal tariff, internal invoicing, depending on, on the use of internal use of goods or, or specific services. These are just examples uh, amongst other display on, on, on that slide. So could concern self-produced consumables. It could uh, concern, for instance, specific uh, hosting, uh, hosting uh, service uh, uh, within a, a research organization, for instance, uh, animal housing or, or something else. Could also concern some specific service. Hello, everybody. Um, sorry so, for being slightly late. I hope you can hear me. Can you all hear me? Someone. Yes, absolutely. Good morning to everybody. I would have a story. I'm very happy to be with you. This is the 38th CS Executive Committee meeting. Okay. I think you have a window it's open. Holidays with yeah. Quite, uh, intense agenda. Because it's. And, give me just two minutes. Uh, I suggest uh, that. Uh,
is it working now you don't hear anybody else in the, in the background no it's gone now Thank okay you. so so my apologies for that I, I i don't know where what it was exactly so, so sorry for that I, I i resume the presentation now So I was just telling you about the internal invoicing and, and what kind of examples or, or practices it may, it may concern. So typically for, for uh, uh, animal housing or, or some kind of service you, you have internally, like uh, accessing a genomic test platform, for instance, or the use of other uh, facilities like a clean room or wind tunnel or other uh, facilities or, kind, for instance, an electronic microscope. So here, the main takeaway for Horizon Europe as compared also to, to what has been introduced in Horizon 20 is now we will have a wider reliance on beneficiaries' usual cost accounting practices regarding the way uh, internal invoicing are calculated. So which this means that there will be no application of the 25% flat rate on top of the unit cost, but instead beneficiaries which have developed internal uh, tariff based on their usual cost accounting practices can rely on their cost, usual cost accounting practices and include in this unit cost, their actual indirect cost they are used to allocate via key drivers, proxies, when they calculate a unit cost for a given facility, for a given service, for a given uh, uh, a good, which is produced internally and, and used internally within the organization. So this is the key difference, this is a key improvement uh, as compared to, to our Horizon 2020. And this is why we, we, we say it's wider reliance on beneficiaries' usual cost accounting practices regarding the specific cost a category for internal invoicing. Now, moving to another specificities in Horizon Europe. Uh, here, it's about in-kind contribution. And in-kind contribution, it's basically when, when a third party, so meaning someone who is not a signatory party of uh, the uh, grant agreement, so not a beneficiary, but someone is providing the beneficiary uh, with something or with someone. So we will second, for instance, uh, one of uh, its employees uh, to a beneficiary. And in-kind contribution are eligible in Horizon Europe. So we will continue with this uh, uh, possibility to declare in-kind contribution uh, as it was already the case in Horizon 2020, but with um, a difference in terms of on the the way you have to declare your in-kind contribution related cost. And the key difference actually lies in the fact if whether um, in-kind contribution are against payment, so if there is a financial transaction between a beneficiary and the third party providing uh, a, a person or, or, or a service uh, to, to the benefit of the beneficiary, or if it is free of charge, if there is no financial transaction between the beneficiary and the and the third party. If it is against payment, there will be no more special article. And I, I have seen uh, this morning some question about uh, the possibility to continue declaring in-kind contribution against payment. So you can still continue, but it's true as compared to Horizon 2020, you will not see anymore a specific article in the Horizon Europe model grant agreement. Why? Because this uh, has been a choice to align with uh, uh, what just Simona explained about corporate approach. We will not have a standalone separate article dealing with that. Basically, in-kind contribution against payments, so when there is financial transaction between a beneficiary and a third party, will have to be declared either under a specific personnel cost category, so for cost for seconded person against payment, or if it doesn't concern uh, uh, the segment of, uh, of the personnel, as other types as purchase goods, works, or services. This will be how you will have to declare. This will be the two cost categories uh, where you will have to declare any in-kind contribution against payment. There will not be any more standalone specific cost category called in-kind contribution against payment, but it's still eligible. It's just the way you declare this, uh, this cost. Now, regarding in-kind contribution free of charge, we will have a specific uh, provision, so two articles dealing with that in the model grant agreement, uh, in order to make sure that this specific cost category is still eligible in Horizon Europe, as it was the case in Horizon 2020. And basically, here you will have to declare your 
in-kind contribution, so, so, so the ping or the person you, 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 you receive as, a, as an in-kind contribution from a third party free of charge in the relevant cost category, uh, as if these uh, uh, in-kind uh, in -kind element were, uh, and, and the related costs were incurred by you beneficiary. So for instance, if it's a person, it would be declared under your personal cost, or if it's uh, uh, an equipment as an equipment, or if it is, uh, for instance, uh, a service as a purchase of services. So you will have to, 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 to decide in which cost category, depending on the nature of the in-kind contribution provided, uh, where you, you, you have to declare this, uh, this, uh, this related in-kind contribution. So this here is actually the same thing as in Horizon 2020. You have to just uh, 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 see what are concretely the things provided free of charge by, by a third party to you and declare as if uh, they were your own cost, actually. Main difference is only direct cost of the third party will have to be reported. And on top, um, there will be the automatic calculation of the 25% flat rate for over rates. There will be one, one exception because I just mentioned, mentioned that. It will be for internal invoicing. So if you want to valorize uh, uh, an internal invoicing coming, an internal service based on internal invoicing uh, provided to you as an in-kind contribution uh, from a third party, you will have to declare it under internal invoice cost category. And here you will not have the 25% flat rate uh, applying because um, as I just mentioned in, under this uh, specific cost category, only actual cost of actual indirect cost can be declared. So um, this is why uh, you, you will have to, to pay attention to that. But basically, this is what you, you have to bear in mind. Both kind of in-kind contribution are eligible, but there are um, some specificities and some uh, features to bear in mind uh, to, to be sure that you, you, you choose the correct um, uh, cost category when you will declare this cost and when you will report this cost. Now, uh, talking about the receipts. Um, here also, we will have a specificity as compared to the general approach, corporate approach stemming from the financial regulation applicable to, 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 to the different uh, EU, uh, EU finance program. Um, basically, uh, receipts will be limited only to the amount you receive under the grant, so the union grant amount you will, you will get after having signed in a grant agreement with us. And any revenue generated by the action. Uh, so this is the definition stemming from the financial regulation. So you see it's, it's quite uh, limited, uh, the notion of receipts. On top, this is also a novelty introduced in the revision of the financial regulation in 2018, non-profit organizations are not consumed by receipts. So they will not have to, 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 to deal with that and they will not have to, to, to report that. They are exempted uh, uh, regarding this, uh, this aspect. In addition, for Horizon Europe, so you see it will really frame, uh, uh, narrow the scope where receipts uh, uh, will be encountered or you will have to be declared because we have an exception in our future regulation. Um, and it makes sense because we are speaking about uh, research and innovation and we want to have especially a focus on exploitation of the results, especially um, under, under Horizon Europe. Um, and here, any income that may be generated by the exploitation of the results stemming from a project will not be considered as receipt of the action. So you see cases of receipts in a nutshell will be rather very limited and will only concern for-profit organization on top. So these are the main things you have to bear in mind uh, uh, about receipts that basically it is something quite well-framed and quite narrow in terms in term of scope for Horizon Europe. Now, um, coming to the equipment cost here, the thing I would like to mention is Basically, it's also continuity with uh, Horizon 2020 uh, in the sense that depreciation cost for equipment will be eligible as the default, uh, default uh, way of calculating and reporting the cost. By exception, full cost of equipment uh, might be eligible. So it's already the case for certain calls uh, when uh, purpose is really to, to, to finance certain type of actions and especially to build up prototypes, for instance. And, and here we will continue with this approach. By default, depreciation, by exception, full cost of equipment will be eligible. Then why we speak about further clarity, because coming back to the example of prototype, we have slightly redrafted the, the text regarding equipment costs um, to, to have more clarity on the fact that 
especially to address the case of prototypes that related capitalized cost when you are uh, building up during uh, during an action because the purpose of the action is really to build up uh, a prototype so that will be normally the last deliverable of your of your action you, you you can declare all the related capitalized costs so all the costs you you put in your account for instance under specific uh, uh, account assets under construction uh, before uh, before moving it to 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 tangible asset for instance uh, uh, account in your balance sheet you will be able to valorize to declare the full construction cost so for instance uh, the cost you value uh, so the cost of your employee building up involved in the, the build up of uh, building up of uh, the, the prototype or also and or also the full purchase cost of all any pieces of equipment any component you you need to build this prototype so uh, we wanted to clarify a bit the wording because today in horizon 2020 for those of you who are familiar we speak only about the purchase cost but maybe uh, we were uh, we were missing some uh, some some element at, uh, at the level of the, the grant agreement we were clarifying the thing in the annotated model grant agreement but we thought it was maybe better to to have a, a text that clarifies uh, this uh, this uh, this possibility so this is how things will be handled for equipment cost by default depreciation by exception uh, uh, the full capitalized cost may be may be eligible and uh, we think that the, the wording will uh, will be clearer uh, for uh, for beneficiaries uh, in order to see what exactly they can declare it, specifically in the case of prototype now um, for indirect cost i think here I, I can be very very quick because in the and I, I've seen also a question, I saw a question also this morning on Slido about 25% uh, uh, if it's still applicable. So yes, it's pure continuity with Horizon 2020. And we will continue to, 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 to go for having a flat rate of 25% to be applied on eligible direct cost um, in order to generate, to trigger overheads uh, in direct cost uh, reimbursement in, in Horizon Europe. So this will be a pure, pure continuation. The only exception, and I already mentioned that, it's, uh, it's for... Um, internally invoice goods and services so for this specific cost category here you will have um, not the possibility to use a flat rate um, but you will have instead and and this was praised by uh, by some organization uh, who are familiar and who have developed usual cost accounting practices for internal invoicing um, you will be in a position to use your actual indirect cost to declare your actual indirect cost uh, this could be embedded in your in your in your unit cost using your usual key drivers in your accountability use usual proxies uh, uh, to to valorize your actual indirect cost so this will be possible but uh, on the contrary 25 percent flat rate will not be applicable for this specific cost category now last uh, last point um, uh, before uh, giving the floor to my uh, to, to, to 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 the last colleague presenting today um, it's about certificate on financial statement so here um, for those of you who are familiar, it's uh, what you have to, to provide uh, when you declare cost uh, uh, up, to, up to a certain amount in order to, for us, for the commission, for your granting authority, if I use the wording in the model grant agreement, uh, to have a kind of overall assurance regarding the eligibility of your cost. Um, so when you will have to, to, to provide this, uh, this certificate on financial statement, um, as compared to Horizon 2020, the threshold will be will be increased, will be will be higher. So it will be uh, 430,000 euros, and uh, the CFS. So here uh, it will be continuity for Horizon 2020. Will have to be submitted only at payment of the balance, only at the end for the last reporting period of your action. You will have to provide such certificate on financial statement. Um, the basis for uh, for calculating this uh, this threshold um, is a basis which is. Um, also standard which uh, which is also uh, uh, which has been also uh, uh, which will be common for different programs it's when this threshold concerns the requested eu contribution calculated on all costs for those of you who are familiar with horizon 2020 you know that the basis is different today it's what it is written it's actual cost plus taking into account some unit costs which are calculated on the basis of usual cost accounting practices so to cut it short the idea was to align uh, and uh, with corporate approach or with what we the other programs will do when requesting a, a certificate on financial statement to use the same basis for calculation it is when you have you reach 430,000 euros as requested eu contribution calculated on all your costs so if you claim this amount 
you declare this amount, if you request this amount, you will be considered at payment of the balance uh, uh, by certificate and financial statement, and you will have to submit uh, a certificate and financial statement. Now, there will be a novelty, and I will not spend too much time on that. Um, it's about the specific case when a beneficiary has, um, has been classified as low risk after a SPA. What is a SPA? Uh, it's a specific audit. I will not enter into detail because my colleague Sorin will, uh, will just tell you more in a, in, a, in a second. So just for you to know, it's a specific uh, kind of audit with possible advantages, benefits for some beneficiaries classified as low risk, uh, meaning they will uh, have advantages or benefits such as having an increase of their threshold uh, when they are obliged to, to, to submit a certificate and financial statement. So it will mean for them, if you increase the threshold, in practice, it leads to, uh, it should lead to less uh, CFS to be submitted. So it should be uh, something uh, more, uh, more beneficial and more interesting for, for beneficiaries. So I stop here. My colleague uh, uh, Sorin will, uh, will, uh, will tell you more about that now and, uh, and uh, will uh, we'll give you uh, concrete features and concrete aspects about the, about the spa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julien. So I think I can take over on the, this last two slides. Um, so basically the novelties regarding audits are uh, related to the system and process audits, uh, which are uh, which is what it's a risk assessment and an audit opinion um, to be done in two steps. Uh, the first is the test of system, or so-called in the audit profession test of controls, and uh, substantive testing, the test of transactions. So both together to have um, an audit opinion and a risk assessment. The risk assessment um, are targeted to to go into three types of risk, uh, which are in, in line with international standards in the matter. Inherent risk at the level um, uh, at the level of the entity, control risk, uh, obviously at the level of the entity, which is linked to the internal control in place uh, by the entity and the so-called budget category specific risk, which is um, due to, to, to control risk uh, of the entity and the project-based related accounting as well. Uh, at, the, at the project level. The objective of all this is to have uh, one output, one single report in two parts, uh, which we call the combined review or the, this part of the system and process audit, uh, and to flag, of course, to, to make an assessment of those uh, of these internal controls in place as low, medium, or high. Uh, depending on that, um, the, the, there are, as Julian just said as well, there are some impacts um, that can be seen in the in this new slide, um, that there could be less or less in-depth exposed audits and a higher threshold in submitting CFS, for example, 725,000 euros instead of 430,000 euros. Um, who can apply? Um, beneficiaries that uses unit, flat rate, or lump sum cost for contributions, according to documented, obviously formally approved and in writing, uh, documents that um, describe the usual cost accounting practices of the beneficiaries uh, or beneficiaries that have formalized documentation on the system and process uh, for calculating their costs and contributions, which are formally approved and in writing, have participated in at least 150 actions under Horizon 2020 in Rotom and participate in at least uh, three ongoing actions under Horizon Europe or Euratom. So obviously the focus is to really uh, focus on this more um, detailed audits, more in intensified audits on, on uh, those that will, will can benefit on them uh, due to their multiple participations. Um, how this could be done uh, quickly, it's, it's the summary, of course, uh, the step one would be to that the beneficiary submits its application in the system, which will be assessed by, by the by the auditors and um, if uh, the application is accepted um, the auditors will directly or indirectly carry out a SPA a system and process audit and the audit result will take form uh, in the form of a risk assessment classification um, in, in that audit report so I, I went quickly to the two slides uh, because of course uh, at this stage uh, this is what is um, in the Model grant agreement, and as you know, the audit comes a bit later. It's exposed, 
so the details will, will come later by working on it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Simona, Morten, Julian, and Sorin. Uh, I am taking over for a while because Peter had to go to a meeting, but he will come back uh, in a while. Um, yes, I think we have a slide uh, with the Slido QR code and, and uh, link. If not, uh, Olivier, maybe you can directly go to the to the list of questions that we have in Slido. If you can. Yes, it's coming. Okay, so I propose that we go through the questions and uh, since this morning we have a number of, of questions that we didn't get an answer. And the first one is, when will the annotated model grant agreement be available? Uh, maybe Simona, if you can answer this. Yes, thank you, Isabel. Uh, if you want, I can also take over uh, to read the question if it helps. Uh, I know that we have received a lot of our, uh, questions on uh, when the annotated model grant agreement will be available. We'll, uh, we can say it will be available in due time, uh, hopefully before the grant agreement, first grant agreements are signed, uh, so you have the provisions. Our aim is, if possible, also to uh, start already uh, even a bit earlier with uh, the most important topics, for instance, if uh, personal costs, and make them available to you even before uh, uh, in... Uh, 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 whenever uh, they are ready. As you know, also the annotated grant agreement for maybe follows the same approach as the model grant agreement in the sense there is also the part of the corporate model grant agreement, which has also have to be discussed internally. But you will have the model grant agreement in due time. Uh, the next question. Uh, if I can go, can a coordinator subcontract project management task to professional organizations? For the coordinator, uh, I will try and if my colleagues want to complete afterwards, I will try to add the coordinator tasks which are set up in the grant agreement cannot be subcontracted. It's the same approach as under Horizon 2020. It has not changed. If it's the main contact point, it has to uh, 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 distribute the payment. It has to receive uh, receives the, uh, the payment. It uh, checks. Uh, uh, if uh, the documents are okay. So these tasks which are specifically mentioned and you will see also in the uh, article of article 7 if I'm not mistaken of the Horizon Euro Model Grant Agreement that the coordination task per se cannot be uh, subcontracting to any third party. Of course there is the possibility always but in, uh, as the Horizon 2020 to subcontract to an entity which has an authorization to administer the possibility to uh, receive uh, the payment. But it's still the same approach uh, as on Horizon 2020 which is controlled and specifically established uh, and under the control of the beneficiary. Simona, I, I will I will read the question so we can just have a break. <laughs> um, so the next question is: um, Will a consortium agreement be required in the same way as in Horizon 2020? And if yes, if we will provide a template, can you cover I this? I can try. So the approach is uh, similar in the sense that the consortium agreement will be mandatory unless otherwise provided in the call. As for a template, uh, no, we are not, uh, at least I'm not aware of any information that we are intending to provide a template. So it will be similar to Horizon 2020. Yes, and, and maybe Simona, if I can just complement that, um, uh, the, the commission, so we have never developed a template. This is something that is done by um, normally uh, uh, other associations. Uh, so I think if, um, uh, because it's an internal consortium matter, so uh, whether or not these organizations are indeed planning to provide a template, uh, we cannot 
reply on their behalf, but uh, will probably uh, there, there will be a continuation from age 2020. Over to you, Isabel. Thank you. Uh, so the next question is, how is the BIT issue treated under whole or, or Horizon Europe contracts? I can also try. It's similar to Horizon 2020 in the sense that deductible VIT is not uh, eligible. The same uh, uh, rules apply. There is just a small clarification because also the corporate now makes reference to the refundable VIT, but this is because refundable VIT is the larger notion than the specific notion of deductible VAT and also in particular it refers to uh, the public entities who the paid VAT to the public entities who act as a public authority but this is mostly a clarification and it comes also for the other programs and from the financial regulation. Thank you very much um, and then the next question is uh, where the governmental time work where the governmental time work is less than 215 days, in France is 200 days, does that mean Horizon Europe will not reimburse 100% of us 15 days are missing? So maybe Morten, this is more for you. Yes, and I, I can try to reply to that one. And maybe, uh, Julien, you can compliment me with your expertise on the French uh, system, um, if, I'm, if I'm missing anything there. But indeed, uh, the, the, the 215 days is a fixed number. Now, it's important to uh, understand also that uh, um, uh, we have fixed this number based on a, let's say, a, a pan-European level. So uh, we fully acknowledge that in some countries you work uh, more, in some countries you work uh, less. Uh, so this should represent an, an average. Now, <clears throat> of course, in, in, in this particular case, uh, where you say, will you not reimburse 100%, uh, actually, uh, we may reimburse 100% because you will simply uh, uh, not be able to change the 215 days in the equation. So in case that the person here has worked full time uh, on the project. Uh, you will, uh, as the upper part of the equation, put the the the, the full um, uh, annual uh, uh, personnel cost incurred for that person divided by two hundred and 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 fifteen uh, days. You have your daily rate, and you simply multiply that by your. Uh, 215 days that the person worked on the action. In this way, you will receive the full amount, uh, 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 the, the full personnel cost of the person. So um, it is simply uh, uh, um, uh, just like under age 2020 that you can all you can always uh, be reimbursed up to 100%. It 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 simply uh, depends on the. The numbers that you put in um, in the calculation uh, method. Julien, you want to compliment uh, me on anything? No, no, no. It's uh, it's fine. It we, for instance, in the in the, the declaration for the number of days, you you, you may basically put uh, eighteen. If you if you divide two hundred fifteen by uh, by twelve, you you have uh, roughly eighteen. So it would be seventeen or eighteen days uh, to be reported each month because the person is working full time and is fully dedicated to the project. And in that way, uh, you will uh, you will multi multiply two hundred by two hundred fifty. So what if you divide by two hundred fifteen and you multiply by two hundred fifteen, you get your uh, full annual uh, personal cost uh, for a given person fully and, and only dedicated to the project implementation. And indeed, this, in our view at least, is one of the uh, the, the main advantages in having a, a less fine-grained system, where you will simply uh, uh, be able uh, to to um, to take into account uh, uh, the 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 days and and the time that you worked on the project, uh, and and include uh, at least from our side quite a lot of uh, flexibility in, in the calculation method. Isabel, over to you again. Yes, thank you. Uh, then the next question is about the proposal template. If I am not mistaken, 
is in table 3.18, what exactly is remaining versus cost? What's the difference with other goods, works, and services? I believe you are not able to answer <laughs> because no. I, am, I, am, I, I this is a question for, for me, probably. Uh, yes, um, what we meant with this uh, text and with these questions is that in the proposal template, we do not want that you include all details about purchase cost. This, we don't want to know the details. Uh, we only want to know about larger items that you will include in this uh, cost category. So this is the reason we ask you to give uh, only explanations when the purchase costs uh, are higher than 15% of your personal cost. If they are lower, if they are lower than 15%, we are not asking you to give us details. And this is also the question, uh, the, 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 um, the, the issue that we will have in reporting as well. So um, when we said remaining purchase costs, this is the cost that are lower than 15%. And for those costs, we don't want to that, to, to that you give details in the proposal and also not in the reporting in the case the proposal is funding. So I, I suppose this is answering the question. So it's related to the 15% of, of uh, uh, percent cost uh, regarding personal cost. Yeah. So the next question is, uh, when should we expect an update of the list of associated countries and should the initiative for association come from a particular institution in the country? Don't know, Simona or Morten? Maybe I can try, Simona. You can always yeah, compliment I, me. I think even better. I think our colleagues who are expert on the international uh, arena are here. So it's better if either Alexandra mm. or Bart take uh, the floor for this one. Like that, you have the information directly from our experts on international aspects. Thank you, Simona. Thank you, colleagues. Um, indeed, on this question, um, as you may remember at the beginning of the presentation, um, it was mentioned that um, there will be a, a list of associated countries, and this list will be included in the program guide. So in Horizon Europe program guide, which is a living document. So this is um, regularly updated depending on the state of play of, of association. Now, as it was mentioned, some exploratory discussion started with uh, some associated countries, but not exactly the process of association as such. Um, also, it was explained this morning that uh, for the purpose of participation in calls, um, um, entities from associated countries will be treated as if they are already uh, pertaining to countries which are associated to Horizon Europe. Of course, funding and signature of the grant agreement will come only at the moment when the association agreement um, is, um, is already applicable. So when it is uh, uh, there, signed already and applicable. Uh, now the second part of the question, should the initiative for association come from a particular institution in the country? I think already Peter draw some, uh, drew some uh, guidance on this. Uh, it is indeed not the Commission, so not the European Union, which starts the process of association. The initiative should come from the associated country. In most of the cases, um, we expect that the countries which are associated to Horizon 2020 will continue association to Horizon Europe. And uh, if it's about a particular institution in the country, well, it depends on the internal organization of each country. Normally, it should be uh, uh, a public or so governmental institution. And uh, the initiative should come uh, from um, <clears throat> regularly, but it's not, uh, of course, compulsory from uh, the relevant ministry. So Ministry of Research, Innovation or Agency, whatever is the, um, the, the institution dealing with the research and innovation in that country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and I believe the next question was also asked this morning. So can a single individual be counted as a legal entity? capable of being part of a consortium? If so, how will goals and funding rates be calculated? I don't know who of you can answer this, Simona or Morten. Uh, 
Well, Julia? I, I, I can start if my colleagues want to complete because I'm not sure I understand. So if we are referring to the natural persons who participate as beneficiaries on our actions, this has not changed. The rules are similar to the uh, to Horizon 2020. They can participate the, uh, in the grant agreement. The cost will be reimbursed via the unit cost because they are natural persons participating as beneficiaries and do not receive a salaries from this point of view. And the funding rate is the same rule that applies. So if that by the single individual, we understand natural persons uh, as, uh, in Horizon 2020. Thank you very much. Um, then we have the next question. If the consortium is led by a researcher, my, must they be in category A? Uh, I think uh, this probably a question of the proposal template or on the researcher's table, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, because you colleagues from the legal unit don't understand the question, right? Yeah, no, the only category A I'm thinking is personnel costs <laughs> when you have the budget table per categories, but I'm not sure since this consortium led, that will be how to declare the cost of that no, research. No, I think this uh, is a question about the researchers table. And in the researchers table, we define the categories not by the role in the proposal, but by their post in, in the organization. So, um, yeah, so the category of these researchers will depend on the, the role of these researchers in their own organization. And so we go, um, I don't know if Peter can already take over. Peter, are you there? Yes, I am back, but I, if you can still take the next one or two so that I get into it again. Yes, yes, no problem. So the next one is uh, what happens if a person works full time on a project for a full year and works more than 215 days? I think you already answered more or less this question, but please, Morten, uh, go ahead. Okay, you so want? you cannot, thank you, Isabel, you cannot report more than 215 days. There's simply that ceiling. Um, and the reason why we have that ceiling is simply because uh, uh, we will not, since we it's pay, since we base uh, everything on on actual cost in in, in, in these grants, um, we will simply not pay more than what uh, the legal entity has actually incurred for that person. So, in case you have a person working full time you can charge all the costs that that uh, legal entity has incurred for, for the uh, particular person here. So in, in that uh, sense, uh, you will be uh, reimbursed 100%. And then this is really all that matters, right? Whether you have spent 216 days working full time, um, you have only incurred the the cost for the 100%, right? Um, so uh, if you work full time, we will reimburse you full time. Okay, I hope that is that is clear. It's not so much related to the 215 days. Uh, again, it's related to the uh, uh, to to the way the the. Um, uh, the reporting is done and uh, respecting this this double ceiling, you cannot re report more cost than you actually incurred and you cannot report more than 215 days because otherwise we would pay too much. Thank you, Morten. Um, then next question, I believe you already explained this in during the during your presentations is, Will time sheets be mandatory in Horizon Europe? What are their minimum requirements? So maybe if you can just summarize what you presented. <clears throat> yes, indeed. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned on, on one of my slides, um, we do no longer require time sheets, but you're still allowed to use them, right? So if, you, if your usual accounting practice is to use timesheets either based on paper or computer just continue to do that it can be in hours it can be in days we have conversion rules don't worry okay so uh, the question here is, is whether it's mandatory or, or not and we 
you're not obliged to use timesheets. But if you don't have your own timesheets, we uh, we simply asked you to fill out this monthly declaration. And the monthly declaration is simply a, a very simple form. It will be uh, published uh, soon, hopefully, uh, where you simply uh, report or add or, uh, or insert the number of days that you have worked each month on the project. It is then signed by the researcher in question and by uh, his or her supervisor. Okay, so that is how uh, it, it's done uh, also for the time sheets now on the horizon 2020. The minimum requirements uh, will be the same. So uh, more in, um, in detail, maybe I can remember them. Um, but uh, as I just mentioned, it needs to be signed by the researcher and the supervisor. So you would need this, uh, this uh, double uh, signing, uh, at least on a monthly uh, basis. Um, and uh, I, think, uh, I think that's it. It, it, it still should be seen. In, uh, uh, if we require what level of detail we require uh, in, in terms of uh, the the number of, of days spent per work package and so on but uh, indeed we will try to keep it as simple as possible the Thank minimum you. requirements in other words will be in in the annotated uh, model grant agreement Thank you Morten um, we go to the next uh, question which is, are in-kind contributions provided by third parties against payment Article 11 in Horizon 2020 possible for quotes other than personal? Uh, for example, equipment, which model grant agreement article is it? I think Simona or Julian, you covered already Jul this in the presentation. Julian, I think he Julian. is there. Yes, indeed, uh, um, I cover it in my presentation. So there will be no uh, particular article, as it was the case uh, indeed in Horizon 2020, this Article 11. Uh, but you can still declare uh, in-kind contribution against payment, but it will be, let's say, treated as a normal financial transaction, except for the case of uh, personal seconding against payment, where here you have a specific article under Article 62A. You have a specific uh, personal cost category, but for other cases where the in-kind contribution against payment does not concern segment of personnel, but something else, like for instance, an equipment or a, a purchase of goods, you will have to declare it under uh, a purchase of goods or work or services. This will be your, your cost category where you will have to declare it if it does not concern uh, segment of personnel against payment. And just one thing, because uh, really regarding the question about uh, unit cost for natural person, uh, it was uh, one of uh, our previous question and already mentioned this morning. So for the person, uh, if he's still he or she uh, still listening, in uh, page 89 uh, of the model grant agreement, which has been published, uh, it's uh, called Annex 2A, you have the detail and the amount of the unit cost uh, that will be used in, uh, in uh, Horizon Europe. And uh, one of the unit costs will be the one uh, which is the same for SME owners and natural person being involved uh, uh, as beneficiary in a project. So you will see the, the exact amount. I don't ha have it uh, in front of my eyes now, but I, I know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's on this page in an X2A. So I think it's something uh, about 283. Um, it's a daily rate. It's a daily rate because now we are speaking about daily rate. So if you want this information, you may find it uh, and the exact amount uh, in the model grant agreement. I think it's page 99 or 90 uh, annex to it. Uh, yes, indeed, you are right, Julian. <laughs> it's uh, 20, uh, 282, uh, uh, cents, and it is in uh, page 89 in annex 2. Hey. Thank you all. Uh, so we go to the next question, which is, do we now need to include a work package on management and coordination? Uh, I think I can cover this if you allow me. Um, we don't impose any obligation on this. This will be totally your decision. So it is up to you to define your work plan. So how many work packages you need to include. And it is always good to have a separated work uh, package on management. 
uh, but it's not uh, something that we impose in, in our proposal. So you have the freedom to do so or not. And maybe we can pass to the next question, which is since cost reporting will now be based directly on sim and simply on days worked, should we also use days in effort plans in part B rather than person months? Uh, this I can also answer. Um, we have thought about it, so we know that this creates some problems, but we also know that the, it's, it is easy to calculate, so to, to pass from days to, to person months. And because we based our ex ante controls in person months, we have decided to keep this figure in the proposal. So in the proposal, in the part B, um, when we ask for the efforts dedicated to each work package, we still use uh, person months. So maybe we go to the next uh, question, which is in Horizon Europe, the linked third parties will be understood as associated parties. Besides that, what are the major changes regarding their legal, their legal framework changes? So maybe it's the model, yeah. Yes, uh, just a first clarification, the linked third parties in the Horizon Europe will be called affiliated entities because we also have associated partners, which is a different uh, a, a different concept. And the name is only in terminology. The changes in terminology is true that it may have also uh, a, an impact on the uh, how IPR references are made in the grant agreement, but the change from Horizon 2020 is in terminology, in labeling to be aligned to the uh, uh, corporate MGA and to the other programs and in particular the article of the financial regulation which clearly mentions affiliated entities but the concept is the same and you will have the details explained now in the horizon euro in the horizon europe uh, mo annotated model grant agreement what we need to uh, and you'll need to make a, to get a bit used to the difference is that when you think affiliated entities, you will not think only of the entities which are uh, linked via capital link, but you also have to include the entities which have a legal link also in the same terminology. So we'll have an entities with capital link and entities with legal link, but they will be called affiliated entities and they are linked third parties as we know them in Horizon 2020. Thank you, Simona. So we pass uh, to the next question, which is uh, any newsletter or save the date for future workshops? This one was really very useful. So thank you very much. And um, here we can say that we publish all the workshops in the portal. And at the end of these presentations, we will also add a slide with the future dates that we have already fixed. Some of the dates we don't know yet. Um, yes, I think Peter can take over now. Peter, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And I, I think you have to leave to the other yes. meeting just to tell you. Okay, thanks again, Isabel, for, for the whole day. So, uh, and to coming back to the previous question, I will at the end show a slide with the workshops that are already planned. And then, of course, we would uh, ask you to go to our to the homepage of the funding and tenders portal uh, regularly. There is a news section, and any new event we will announce, of course, at, in this news section directly at the homepage. Okay, next question: Are there any limitations on subcontracting costs? Simona, for you. Oh, yes, I can try. Uh, the approach is also similar to Horizon 2020. There is no particular uh, limitation in that the subcontracting costs have to be, I don't know, X percent of the cost incurred by the uh, undeclared by the beneficiary. However, as you know, the rules remain the same. The beneficiaries must have the appropriate resources to implement the action themselves and where only needed involve third parties, including subcontractors, uh, to carry out the work under the action. So therefore, too much use of subcontracting or other third party may somehow invo uh, um, uh, impact the evaluation, but a cer certain or specific limitation on how much costs you 
declare is depend on what you are subcontracting. And as you know, you are declaring a price there. So it includes a profit margin. Therefore, there are specific rules when you declare the subcontracting, when you will subcontract tasks to a certain uh, third party, like, like, namely no profit, uh, uh, sorry, no conflict of interest and uh, um, best value for money. And it's quite clearly written in the model grant agreement that only that the subcontracting may only cover a limited part of the action activities. So, um, so indeed, the, the the limitation is not that concrete, but there is a limitation that it must be limited. Okay. The next question is immediately linked. What is the difference between service and subcontracting? Same as in Horizon 2020. So subcontractors are those who may carry out work under the action, but we, uh, when you are doing a, a service, when you are providing a service, so like what we had in Horizon 2020 contract, is for beneficiary that carries uh, to help the beneficiary carry out the work under uh, themselves under the action. They will be put under other goods, uh, services, and work. Uh, as a uh, C3, if I'm not mistaken, on the Horizon 2020 category, different from subcontracting where they are B3. And the services, for instance, uh, an example uh, could be the certificates or disseminations or activities, they will be also possible to charge indirect costs on them, uh, different from the subcontracting where they will be excluded from the indirect cost uh, uh, calculation. Okay, thank you. Uh, very concrete, the next question. What happens if a researcher receives a promotion during the year and their salary increases? How is the daily rate calculated? I guess, Martin, you want to get in on this one. Your guess is right, Peter, and thanks for that question, Diana. It's a very good one. I thought there was, saw there was also another one, very related one in um, on, the, on the Slido page. So, <clears throat> Uh, as you may recall, I, I, I showed in one of the slides that you only need to calculate the daily rate uh, once per reporting period. Okay, so in case that uh, there is an increase or decrease in the salary during the year, it doesn't really matter that much because it we we will simply look at the actual annual cost for the year. So not let's say it's not an error, it's uh, the, the upper part of the equation, it's simply the total cost incurred during the year, okay? So whether the, the salary is a bit different for the first, a bit lower for the first three months of the year, and then uh, higher during the last nine months of the year, it doesn't really matter because it's the total cost of the year that you need to report, okay? So I hope this makes sense. Um, there was another question in Slido, Peter, which uh, was a bit related, but it says, what, what happens to my budget if there's a promotion during the year, right? Uh, and I think that there's two different concepts you need to understand. One is the budget in your proposal, right? And the other one is what you declare. And if those costs are 100% uh, equal to each other, you did a really good job, okay? But the whole idea of a budget is that it is your estimate of how much money you will spend on personnel cost, on subcontracting, on other direct costs, and so on. But we don't expect you to uh, be able to, to calculate 100% correctly the amount. Okay, So in your budget, in your proposal, uh, it's your estimations, and in that you can include a, include a buffer. You can you can play with the contingency. What do I know? But this will always uh, be the maximum grand amount that we are able to pay. So if your budget for personnel cost is too low, there's two possibilities. Either you will need to find the money on your own, in for instance, in your indirect cost or, or somewhere else, or Maybe you're lucky that someone else in the consortium have, have not spent all their uh, uh, available credits in their budget, and you will be able to do budget transfer even without asking us for permission to do so. So don't worry. Don't uh, take the, uh, the model grant agreement 
uh, rules as an excuse for not promoting your employees, you can do that and and um, and you can still take the cost into account and hopefully you have also taken any promotions or any increases uh, in the budget due to promotion, due to like index regulation of, of prices increase and so on into account. That is, I think, normal budgetary uh, practice. Over to you, Peter. Okay, thank you. And I pass to the next question. Is it possible to report 215 days in a project and 20 days, for example, in another project? I assume this is meant for the same person in the same year. It, it's, it, that, that will be the, the, the assumption that we, we are replying uh, under indeed. So just to, to make sure that everyone is on the same page, we have a person apparently working full time in, in, in one project, our project A, reports 215 days, the full salary, and of course is then reimbursed the 215 days uh, uh, of, of working and 100% and of the, the, the personnel cost incurred for that person. But the pro the, the this research is really good, right? Because he's also participating in, in Project B, where he's playing a, a, a minor role and only working uh, 20 days during that year in Project B. Now, the double ceiling I just mentioned before and the, the, the rule that you can not report more than 215 days in a project actually uh, uh, is, um, is applies also to all other EU grants that you participate in. So we, and this is hopefully it makes a lot of sense for you, but we do not uh, support double funding. We cannot uh, provide uh, double funding. So in this case, uh, you can only report uh, um, up to 215 days during a year in all the EU grants that you participated in. So in this case, you would need to find another way of, of uh, accounting for the, the, the additional 20 days. Either you can distribute it uh, across the two projects if you want to make sure that you, you that your work is visible in the two projects, uh, decreasing the 215 days in one of them, uh, or, or you simply only report the 215 days in, in project uh, A. Okay, next question related. If a person works more or less than 250 days in a calendar year, how to handle this situation? I think for the more, you have already replied. The question for the less, I guess the reply is even easier. Uh, yes, so as I mentioned, the, the 215 uh, days is, is the fixed part of, of the equation here. So, it, 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 but it, it doesn't equal the, well, it, as I also showed, the, the, let's say the, the first part of the equation is actually that you multiply your daily rate with the actual number of days that you have worked uh, on the project. So, in case you work less, you report less. And if you if you mean part time, I also showed some pro rata uh, uh, calculations. Okay. Again, related to the same subject, a person working in two parallel projects having different reporting periods. So it might happen that same periods will have different daily rates. Is this an issue? I hope you understand this, Martin. I'm just rereading it. How to account the expenses for engineers involved? Oh, no, the in... yellow one before the yellow. Yel one. The yellow one. Sorry, it's switching. But a person working in two parallel projects having a different reporting period, so it might happen that the same periods will have different daily rates. Will have is an issue. A diff... How can they have a different daily rate in two parallel projects? Uh, will the Daily, okay, so I, I understand maybe that there could be a, a, a case um, where you, where, let's say the last reporting periods in different projects um, uh, uh, will have a, 
a different daily rate. But uh, it's not an issue as such because the daily rate will be uh, simply um, applied on uh, uh, on the um, uh, uh, on on the sorry, there was just some noise in the background. Okay. But the daily rate will simply be uh, we will simply apply it to the to, re to to the reporting period. Simone, you wanted to add anything? No, I wonder if it's uh, linked to the project-based remuneration, or maybe I don't know, Julian, if you have an, uh, you understand the this as being related to project-based remuneration because otherwise the daily rate is cal calculated per calendar year so they have to take all the actual personal costs and divide it by 250 215 I, uh, so that's why i'm not sure i understand also the question but maybe julian if it can be linked to the project-based remuneration and given that the, you have the national reference and the action reference I'm not sure it's linked to project-based remuneration, but basically what you have to keep in mind is uh, if a reporting period is uh, span over two calendar years, for instance, <clears throat> you will have to, to calculate for each calendar year a daily rate. So normally it will be, <clears throat> for instance, if we speak about two Horizon Europe parallel projects, it will be the same daily rate you will use for, uh, for a calendar year X and cal calendar year Y uh, and maybe calendar year X and Y are covered by, uh, by a reporting period. So this is this is the example of Morton where he detailed, for instance, uh, the different um, uh, daily rate you have to calculate per calendar year uh, that may be covered by a given reporting period. So I do not see exactly a case where there will be two, two daily rate di 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 different if we are speaking about two Horizon Europe uh, project or pro another project that is using the same corporate daily rate calculation. So. Okay, and I mean, this is one of the disadvantages of such remote meetings that you cannot immediately ask back what is meant here. So we have but, to uh, get it that for the moment. Yes. Uh, I would like just to maybe uh, complement some, some questions we already answered and just to, to, to be clear. Okay. O also about things when it was written, if someone works more or less or, or, or if I am fully involved in any case, what you will have to do is to monitor the actual uh, time spent on the action by uh, a given uh, a given employee. Meaning, um, uh, we will go for we will propose, but you can continue with your time recording system if they are if they are uh, sufficiently uh, uh, let's say real, reliable. Um, but we will propose this uh, this monthly declaration with um, minimum number of information to report and notably the actual number of. Of, of days spent. So it's not calendar days, right? it's an aggregated amount. It, it, it represents uh, the aggregated amount of days or, or day equivalent. Um, if uh, for those of you who remember uh, the slides presented by Morton, if you have a system in hours and you have to convert things into days, we are speaking about days equivalent. What you have to put in this monthly declaration in your, is your actual number of day equivalent or days. Uh, aggregated for the whole month. Huh? It's not something we, we ask you to, to do per, uh, per calendar day per month. It's per month, aggregated level. Um, but this is the actual, uh, actual number of days or days equivalent you have to report. So it cannot be more or less, or it cannot be something um, just estimated. So this is just uh, what I wanted to, to, to say. I know it's, uh, it's not so easy to, to draft a question in, uh, in this format mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. So you are, you are pretty right, uh, Peter. So it's yeah. just um, something popping up in my head when I, I was reading some, some of the questions. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I am looking at the time and I think I will take two more questions and then we will try to wrap up. So next one, how to account the expenses for engineers involved in the project working as self-employed and getting paid for the actual work done? So this is about consultants or uh, this kind of people. Uh, Martin or? No, no, Martin. Julian, you can have a go, but I guess that this is what we uh, what we also refer to as in-house consultants or, or persons working uh, uh, for the beneficiary under under a direct contract, uh, uh, other than an employment contract. So, Julian, if you want to have a go, let, uh, you know, be my guest. No, but, it's um, just the yeah. here. So, what you will have, so the case of self-employee or let's say in-house consultant or. or, or you have really to go into the details of the case. It's really case by case in the sense, um, either the person is 
let's say to summarize the thing, it's pay against milestones deliverable, not pay for the time uh, actual work done on the project. And here it seems to be to be the case. So here it will not be um, an in-house consultant in the sense of uh, uh, personnel cost for us to be declared under personnel cost under Horizon Europe, as, as it would be also the case in Horizon 2020. Why? Because basically this person, this self-employed person is not working as an employee based on daily rate, uh, the remuneration or the amount he, he get via a direct contract. Here it will not be a, an employment contract, I understand, uh, with the beneficiary. The contract he will have with the beneficiary, if it's something based on, 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 on hours, on time spent on the action, and, and he works like an employee under similar condition, it is, um, it is pretty, pretty clear from the Article 62A2, uh, the direct uh, uh, person working under a direct contract, typically in-house consultant. Here it's a personal cost. If it's something, it's an agreement where basically the person is paid against achievement, milestone, deliverable. It, it is rather depending if it's, uh, it could be subcontracting or purchase of services. It depends here. Uh, it's something Simon already explained and, and when she answered the previous question about the difference between subcontracting and purchase of services, it will depend if the agreement between the self-employee and the beneficiary is about uh, doing for the self-employee to self-employed person to, to do a part of the action task as they are described in the next one or it's a service he provides to the beneficiary in order for the beneficiary to implement him, uh, itself a part of the action task so this will be you see it it's, could be either personal cost it could be either purchase of services it could be or it could be a subcontracting cost depending on the nitty-gritty of the case um, but here if you are in the question, the way it is phrased, not speaking about to get paid for actual work done, but maybe I assume based on milestone or something else, will not be uh, normally a personal cost, uh, uh, a case covered by personal cost. Okay, thank you. And the last question we can cover today Should I add payable free days vacation to working days for counting the day rate? Are free days paid according to the employment contract eligible costs? Martin, yes. I assume again. I can reply to that one, uh, dreaming myself away to a vacation almost. But I think that uh, here maybe it's important to um, to specify uh, where it should be added because it's not uh, so clear from the uh, from the question itself. But uh, it is of course important that uh, days that you uh, spend on holiday whether it's paid or, or or not paid should not be taken into account in the days worked on the project i think that hopefully makes sense but um but if they if you're paid uh, have a paid uh, annual leave day then of course it can be included in the annual uh, uh, personnel cost of the person okay so uh, if we just go through the different uh, uh, elements that may be included in the personnel cost of the person paid vacation could be one of them the fixed salary is another one it could be any uh, you know any allowances like family allowances that are, are set out in, in national law any uh, bonuses paid on on, on objective uh, uh, conditions social security contributions uh, taxes uh, and, and 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 things that are part of the usual accounting practices the usual uh, remuneration practices of the uh, uh, of the the legal entity in question so that is is basically continuity from horizon 2020 for those of you who know the rules for that one okay thank you very much we have to stop here because we reached the end of the meeting Bef before i come to the final few things uh, i have to maybe clarify one issue of the morning where we spoke about the eligibility for associated and third countries and so on, and what if uh, and how they can become coordinators and so on. So I should be maybe even a bit more precise. Yes, indeed, uh, in principle, any partner from any country in the world can participate in Horizon Europe. Another question is, of course, the eligibility for funding. And when it comes to the association, meaning uh, that the one or the other to be associated country is, uh, we will not hope that this will happen, 
but it might uh, still be the case, even theoretically, that by the time they uh, are not yet, um, and by the time they want to sign the grant agreement, the association is not yet fixed and finished. Uh, so in principle, also uh, participants from third countries, as long as they are beneficiaries, can be coordinators. That is the clarification I want to make. And now before you all leave, we would ask you to still reply to two very little and quick polls. And the first poll would be related to the afternoon, so to the model grant agreement. And Olivier, could you bring up this first poll related to the model grant agreement? And please go all again to Slido and click the respective option on Slido. Olivier, is this feasible? It's coming just once again. Okay, yes, we see that there are still some people around. Okay, very good. I think the figures are consolidating. I wait still a few seconds for everybody who wants to actually be in there. Okay, so we see at least half of you partially agree to the question and one fifth even fully agrees. That is relatively good news for us. Thank you very much. And I think we will stop this one now and go to the last poll of today, where we would like to see whether you indeed consider participating in Horizon Europe. Olivier, can you bring up the other one? Okay, I think the picture is also very clear. I still wait a few seconds. Okay, thank you very much. The picture is clear. The vast majority of you is either already starting to prepare a proposal or uh, is seriously considering the participation now. Very good. And before we leave, I want to show one last slide. So I try to share my screen. Is this visible? Yes. Yes. Okay, I still try to put it on full screen. So this is ju just to indicate to you what will happen next. So we will have a second part of the morning session where we go deeper into all the horizontal aspects like open science, gender, and so on, on the 21st of April. I already mentioned the thematic info days for each of the six clusters and for widening that will start at end of April and then spread throughout the whole month of May. 
We will then also in the coming months organize even more specialized and more in-depth uh, single webinars on the different issues, open science, gender, dissemination, exploitation, third country participation, ethics, and so on, uh, for the real specialists on these topics. And then I should not forget to mention that we will have the 2021 edition of the Research and Innovation Days that will this time not but, uh, take place in September, but in June. So the date that you can note for yourself is 23rd of 24th of June, uh, where we will also have a, a particular section dealing with all these implementation issues and where, where we, where we, I mean, the team that was here today will also be present again. And as I said, if you want to stay up to date and know what happens, go to our portal, to the link that is given here and check the news section from time to time. And then you will have all the latest information. I think with this, I would like to thank everybody for the interesting discussion. I should also mention that we will now go through all the questions. You might have seen that more than 1,000 questions have arrived. We will not be able to prepare written replies to all these questions, but we will analyze them and they will feed into future webinars, into our guidance documents, into the FAQ database. So please don't think that all your questions are lost. They will certainly be analyzed and will be used for improving all our guidance. And I think with this, I thank you again all for participation and I close this.